host tonight, uh, Dr. Dalito Sulamoyo from the United States, um, Dr. Dumisani Kamwana from the United Arab Emirates, and at some point we might have Dr. Lloyd Mahoe also from the United States. Now, before we start everything, I would like to call upon Dr. Osbert Msusa to open for us with a word of prayer. That's William. Can he, can he be told? Uh, thank you so much. Um, thank you, uh, Dr. Uh, Dr. Naomi. Uh, let us pray. Heavenly Father, we want to thank you for this wonderful moment. We give you all the glory, honor, and praise. Father, as we are connected from different continents, uh, different time zone, but one thing that we have in common is that Malawi, and that we are all from Malawi, and that country that we love so much and that God you love so much that country. And we pray the Lord Jehovah, as we have uh, this interface with Honorable Attorney Gionel, we pray the Lord Almighty God, we pray for peace and we pray the Lord this interface that um, you will be with us here and you will lead us and you will guide this, uh, this session, oh God. We pray all this in the name of Jesus, amen. Amen. Thank you very amen. much. And since you have the floor, I would like you, I would like to welcome everyone to this session tonight. And just for my um, surety, can you please, with a show of hands, show that you can see me and hear me correctly? Please, there, okay, okay. Okay, over to you, George. Some welcoming remarks, please. Oh, thank you, uh, thank you so much. Um, I would like to welcome you uh, all. Uh, first, let me welcome the, uh, um, the ambassadors and, and honorable ministers that are joining us today and everyone that has joined today. And I want just to ask you that um, whilst you are joining, uh, if, you can, um, if you can remain muted, unless you have been asked to speak, but also if um, uh, this, uh, just let you know that this session is recorded. Um, this session is recorded, and also I want to ask you that um, if you are using a gadget, like say for example uh, Nokia, Nokia, or you're using Samsung Level, if you are, if you is possible that you can put you can put your name so that um, if you in case you want to speak, so that we don't need to call you by the gadget, but we can be able to address you by your name. Um, uh, this session, as I've said, is a recorded session, and also it will be on our available on our uh, YouTube and also Facebook. Um, let me hand over back to the uh, mistress of sermon. Thank you. Thank you very much. And just to add on to those um, housekeeping rules, um, please feel free to make use of the chat option. We did try to collect as many questions as we could for our guest, but please feel free to add any more questions you may have in the chat. Um, after his remarks, we will open up the floor to everyone to ask questions. Do remember to remain polite and um, keep your questions to the point, short and to the point. We are expecting quite a group tonight, so it would be nice if everyone can have a chance to ask their questions. Um, at this point in time, let me call on the chairperson of MCPDN, Chalong Vula, to welcome our guest tonight. Thank you. Uh, thanks very much, Dr. Naomi Sosa. <clears throat> um, good evening, uh, good morning, good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen, depending on which part of the world where you are. Um, this is an exciting moment for the Malawians in the diaspora when we get to have an opportunity again 
to interface with an, an individual at the heart of our government. Uh, allow me to specifically thank the Attorney General, Tabo Chakaka Nyelenda, for making himself available to speak to us. When we knocked on the door, he never hesitated but agreed to engage us. Tabo need no introduction. At 40 years old, he's one of the youngest to hold his op this office in Malawi a product of Chancellor College and University of Sussex in the United Kingdom. He took on this role coming from experience working at the legal aid department, Ministry of Justice and the Reserve Bank of Malawi. On the 27th of August, 2021, His Excellency President Chakwera appointed him as the Attorney General of Malawi. As we are living in a world where through improved technology, the channels of communication have been many, while such is a good thing, it has also brought the challenge where some of the information that goes around, especially on social media, and at times mainstream media, is rather distorted or doesn't fully represent what is happening on the ground. It is for this reason, it is for this reason ladies and gentlemen, while looking at the work that the Attorney General has done since he was appointed, that we thought it would be great to have him with us. His presence today will achieve two main things. One, we will get clarity on some of the high profile issues that he has worked on, including having a great understanding of the work of his office. Secondly, the diaspora will have opportunity to share ideas and provide advice where it is deemed necessary. With this, allow me to introduce our Attorney General, Tabo Chakaka Nyelenda, to address the gathering with his opening remarks. Honorable Tabo Nyelenda. Thank you so much, the first three to the organizing team, and also uh, maybe a special thanks to the ambassadors uh, in, in Brussels, is uh, attending this uh, is uh, uh, ambassador allowing the United Kingdom for attending the, this uh, session, and um, also uh, to the participants. I think uh, it's a, a huge honor actually to speak to you, uh, Malawians in the, in the diaspora. I think the first thing that I need to also to mention, and you have already mentioned um, in the, uh, the chairperson has already mentioned about uh, uh, where I studied and how I became appointed as Attorney General for the Republic of Malawi. But also I think what has not been mentioned is about uh, the role of the Attorney General. Um, I think I'll start with this, uh, which is a common knowledge that uh, the Attorney General is <clears throat> um, a constitutionally established office. Everybody knows, I think each time my name is mentioned uh, in the media in Malawi, that uh, in Chichewa they say, Mlangi Zwankuru Waboma, Pankani Zamalamulo, that is a legal advisor, chief legal advisor to government. So by government, of course, the confusion comes in uh, when people think government, it only means the executive branch of government. So by government, it means uh, all the three branches of government. So that is the judiciary um, headed by the chief justice, the legislature uh, headed by the um, speaker of the national assembly and the president um, uh, uh, headed by, I mean, the executive headed by the president. So I provide advice to all the three branches of government. And these are the things that are not actually known to the public because each passing day, even yesterday, I was providing some piece of advice to parliament. Um, but then I'd say that apart from that, uh, for people that who also would want to know the role of the attorney general is the fact that the attorney general is also um, one responsible for supervising charitable trusts. So those, whether it's international charitable trusts that are registered in Malawi, um, that, that, that operate in Malawi, or local trusts that are either registered under the Trustees Incorporation Act or under the Companies Act. Um, then, of course, I also represent the government in sus by or against government. Um, I'll expound on those issues later. And then, of course, when it, whenever you see a bill going to parliament, you see that bill bearing the name. 
Can I proceed? Yes, AG. Yes. So you 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 see bills going to parliament bearing the name of the attorney general. So these bills will be money bills or general bills. But let me start with bills. Um, that would also reflect we are having so many problems uh, in the country to say we are actually retrogressing, going backwards and the like. So those bills, I mean, no country can develop without uh, actually proper legal framework and proper laws. But I you know that uh, there is no country that would develop in the world if you, uh, that country doesn't have a sound legal uh, uh, structure, if that country doesn't have um, proper institutions that would implement uh, development uh, goals for the country. Uh, I think Dr. Naomi Nguira, as an economist and a teacher of economics, will also agree with me that when they're teaching about development, they're talking about social development, and they're also teaching about economic development. And this tends to conflict um, because when you are pursuing social development, out state the relevance of what I'm saying now, um, they conflict with economic development. So my role as an attorney general is so critical that when we are also going to parliament with bills, we have to ensure that those bill, bills that are taken to parliament, we pursue either social uh, development or economic development. Um, so, and of course, the law is that because those uh, 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 laws that are uh, enacted in parliament, they create institutions. Those institutions that are created uh, by parliament, of course, that those laws come through uh, uh, my office, those institutions are supposed actually to pursue either social development goals or economic uh, goals. And then, of course, when they are we're having money bills. When I'm talking about money bills, I'm referring to uh, where government borrowing from outside uh, the country, mostly. That's where cannot borrow, government cannot borrow without uh, 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 going to parliament. So you may know that those money bills, when they get to parliament, they are sent to, they are passed by parliament and are sent to by the president, they become law. And, and, and when they become law, they need to be implemented. So when you look at that, and, and my role as well, is also to advise on those bills when they go to parliament, that as if you are going to parliament with a money bill, are we really pursuing the intended purpose? So if the purpose is social development, so if we're borrowing, for example, to pursue a social development goal, how are we going to pursue that? Do we have institutions um, that uh, would pursue those goals? Or do we have sufficient or competent people uh, in those institutions? You know? So then of course, if you are talking about economic development as well, you're also looking at, okay, if we're borrowing for economic development, um, what, what is it that we're going to do? Uh, are we going to repay them? And then of course, when you're borrowing for economic development, you also need to do some due diligence. Have you done um, financial due diligence, have you done a legal due diligence, or business due diligence as well on that. So we know, of course, Dr. Naomi Nguira, who was a teacher of economics, would actually maybe correct me, I could also maybe perhaps agree with me, that uh, how he uh, initially was pursuing this, uh, I think initially it was a, a state intervention type of development where the state was uh, taking active role in development, and, and that's why we have Relevance will come it will be open longer. Uh, we had ADMAC, Agricultural Development Corporation, of so many subsidiaries, including uh, Auction Holdings Limited, India Bank, and other so many companies. We also had uh, Malawi Development Corporation, uh, and, 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 uh, and we had so many subsidiaries, including uh, Sun Belt um, and Pico. Um, and, and then we also had press corporation, of course, that was quasi-government because um, at, at, some, at some point though it was private, but it was uh, performing 
a very important law um, in the economy. So you say, why are you saying this? Because this is a law and then I need to advise on this and also look at uh, how do we actually move forward and how are we lost? So I think that the Attorney General plays a very important role in as far as development is concerned. Um, you say, why? Because even a law, the central bank itself was created by a law. So it has to follow the law. Uh, uh, and then everything that it, whether it's monetary policy or price stability, it's a law that uh, 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 created it. So my law, therefore, is that if you have got institutions in the country that actually are either established to provide uh, economic development goals, they have actually to pursue them within the law. And sorry, actually, sorry, uh, but, sorry, Attorney General. Sorry, Honorable Attorney General. May I suggest to the one that is managing? Yes, yes, Your Excellency. I think I could just hear the voice that is just a stumble. I think she was going to suggest that we do a better job with muting people. And we'll do our very best to do that. Oh, oh, okay, okay. Okay, so can I proceed? Yes, please. Yes, uh, I think I, I digress. I think it's something that I've said, something that you never expected because you expected me to say something about what I do. But these are things that I do. So many things that I do, 99% of the things that I do that you don't even know that are happening. And then also, I also mentioned about that, that advisory law, but let me also say, talk about uh, when we're talking about representing government in suits by or against government or public officers. And this is under the civil procedure in brackets suits by uh, or against government or public officers or, uh, cross brackets act. Um, this under this act, um, the attorney or suits or, or maybe I think I need to simplify all court cases against government or public officers, they are instituted against the attorney general. So uh, when 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 these 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 proceedings are done, when these uh, proceedings are done, um, that have to be done with that view in mind. When I'm saying that everything that is done is either to promote social development or economic development. Now, when you see me uh, representing government, challenging certain um, uh, uh, claims against government, for example. We had a claim, for example, of 131 billion question um, uh, for uh, by a certain Asian who said that uh, he had during the one party era um, had his uh, building in Blanta uh, expropriated without adequate compensation. Um, then we had, for example, um, a, a case uh, involving 30 billion question uh, where there was an intention to award a contract for the supply of ambulances by the Minister of Health. And, 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 and even though that, uh, that uh, tender was canceled, the one, one of the participants in the tendering process commenced proceedings and actually got judgment uh, with over 30 billion question. And then of course, so many cases that I'm handling um, on behalf of government. And then, of course, when you look at this, um, at some point, it looks like we've lost the Attorney General temporarily. Let's give him a second to come back. Okay, whilst he's trying to come back, um, just to let you know that you can let us know where you're joining us from in chat. And when the Q&A session starts, you are also free to
pose your questions in any language of your choice, as long as you are certain that the Attorney General will understand you. Because we had a question, please feel free to use the language of your choice. Thank you. Yeah, he's back. But you are muted, Attorney General. Can you hear me now? Yes. Yes, we can. Okay. Uh, sorry, I you lost me because I'm using a phone. I had a problem with my laptop. So I'm trying, uh, somebody called me and then uh, disturbed my connection. Uh, can you give me just uh, a, a 30 seconds? Oh. Yes, so let, 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 let me proceed. Um, what I was also saying was about um, the cases that I'm handling. Uh, are you able to see me? Hello? No, no, you cannot see you. Can I uh, uh, leave and rejoin? Maybe you should be able to see me. Uh, 30 seconds. Okay. All right. Um, welcome Malipa from Nairobi. We've got people from South Africa. We've got people from the RSA, from RSA from the UK and from Malawi. Um, there were questions as well. Um, people asking if this is a partisan meeting. It is not a partisan meeting. It is for all Malawians in the diaspora. Um, it is just a platform that we use to be able I can proceed. Can I yes, proceed? Can. Yes, you can. I hope you are seeing me now. So I've joined now using my uh, laptop. I, I was uh, sorry, I haven't taken any, uh, I haven't prepared any uh, write up. So I'm just uh, speaking from what I know. As I said, there was no need for me to prepare any write up because uh, I, I'm, 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 I'm talking about things that I'm doing, uh, things that I live, I practice. Sorry, sorry so, Bona. Uh, pardon? We missed about five seconds. See your eyes. Pardon? That's better. That's better. Okay, yeah. Yes, so can I proceed? May I proceed? Oh, please, please, yes, you please. can. Yes, please. yes, you can. Yes, so I, I, I was, yes, uh, I, I ended at the time yes. that I was saying there are so many cases that I've been handling, and then I needed to, I wanted to just find why this is important uh, that I, I need to mention. Uh, for example, our budget is three trillion kwacha, and our budget being three trillion kwacha is just an estimate. So the estimate is that uh, maybe Malawi Revenue Authority is going to correct uh, uh, maybe one bit, one trillion kwacha. The road traffic is going to correct uh, so much money, maybe 200 million by registrar general's office, and like so, and maybe the donors are going to give us so much money. Um, Malawi Revenue Authority corrects. Uh, last year, it collected 1.1 trillion kwacha. And out of the 1.1 trillion kwacha, over 780 billion kwacha was used for those what they call statutory expenditures. You can get the statistics from parliament and from working from treasury. So uh, meaning therefore that uh, uh, government would only have less than 300 billion kwacha for other activities, including maybe purchasing the fertilizer for the development activities and other stuff. Um, but of course, I said there are other sources of collecting revenue. And uh, so if you're looking at uh, uh, saving over 200 billion kwacha, it means perhaps uh, that is a saving that will also go towards uh, 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 whether social development or economic development. Um, so that's one part um, of the things that I'm doing as the attorney general. And then of course, also mentioned, I'm head of the bar, as head of the bar, I uh, my role is to ensure that there's discipline in the profession, 
and, and, and therefore to ensure that there's discipline in the profession, the errant lawyers uh, need to be disciplined. You may have been hearing about uh, lawyers getting suspended, others getting debarred from practicing uh, the profession of the law. And that's my law. Uh, why I'm saying so is, as I said earlier on, there's no country that can develop without the rule of law. And each and every sector of the society, whether uh, you'd say uh, Dr. Norman Guira as an economist will say, uh, those that support neoliberal, that uh, the state shouldn't have no role in the economic development of the country, or those that uh, are proponent, proponents of the state intervention, that will say that what we're practicing between 1964 and 1996, uh, that the state should actively take this part in the development activities, uh, you need the law. So without the law, uh, uh, you can't uh, move forward. And therefore, because for us actually to have the law implemented, we need stakeholders like lawyers. But if I got indiscriminate lawyers, we may not be so, I know the objectives, whether you are for the social development, which actually has been the case from 1996 to uh, around 2010, or you are for actually both state intervention and neoliberal, which of course, uh, I think this time around we're pursuing. Uh, we need actually, as I said, lawyers, and I said rule of law, and they cannot be proper rule of law if I've got indisciplined lawyers. So that's the other part of my role. The other issue that I also need as actually by way of introduction is that we are also pursuing this issue of uh, recovery of uh, resources. So the recovery of resources in two ways. The first is where you have civil servants um, stealing or you have citizens stealing, uh, actually maybe irregularly taking over properties. Uh, I, 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 as a as journal, I've seen that maybe you can take these people to court and when you take these people to court, they'll be convicted. And therefore maybe they, have, they won't be any recovery. So what I've been doing is that I've been commencing civil suits. A good example of the civil suits that I've commenced is the one by against uh, those that took over ship, the assets of Shire Bus Lines Limited. Um, you have got bus depots in Zimba, uh, Lilongwe, uh, Blanta, and Mzuzu. So there are also workshops in Mzuzu and Blanta. Uh, actually, uh, these actually, they are prime, prime assets. And actually, if they are properly managed, they can actually contribute to the development of the country. Uh, this time around, I'm pleased to uh, inform you that the city assemblies, with the exception of the Mzuzu, um, uh, a workshop, the city assemblies, respective city assemblies or town assemblies have taken over management of those depots. Uh, I think that is one of the milestones, uh, but of course, without beating my own drum. And then there are other activities that we also, also my office is pursuing. These relate to, well, for example, um, I, I'm talking about money bills, government bonus. I really also, for example, give you two scenarios. The first scenario uh, is, of course, when we're talking about the debt burden and who caused this debt burden. The, you, you look at, um, for example, we borrowed over $161 million from Exit Bank of China to upgrade the fiber network uh, in Malawi for internet. And this actually is, uh, uh, they're using the ESCOM lines uh, because it's difficult to vandalize the ESCOM lines because of the voltage there. Uh, <clears throat> so uh, $161 million is a debt that we got and now we have started repaying, but we're not getting uh, much money from that uh, borrowing. What is happening, there's a company, um, something that is in, at, the, at, at, this, at this stage is not in public domain, is group internet that is managing those, those, those fiber networks. And actually the money that uh, they are paying uh, uh, to uh, ESCOM and then, by, uh, then, then for all not limit us to government is not even enough to repay that loan. 161 million US dollars is 161 billion uh, uh, quash. But of course, when you're talking about uh, dollars, uh, it's difficult to get dollars. 
for maybe if it were a quarter, if we had a scrum billion quarters, they have the same, oh, this is not a, uh, a, a huge amount. But when we're not talking about that, of course, yes, uh, IMF uh, is on the neck of Malawi because we uh, got too much debt. Then we have to interrogate what kind of debts are these? How are they, uh, in fact, uh, utilized? Do we properly utilize them? We also got a loan from India uh, worth of uh, $60 million and $70 million, where we said we're going to invest in the sugar uh, industry in, in, in Salima's, uh, I think we have got Salima sugar here. Now we look here, the ones that are managing, they are not even properly accounting for um, that investment, but look here, the agreement is that uh, this company is going to repay that loan to Malawi after 15 years of operation. And that loan is being repaid by government. So we also have to look back and say, okay, how do we reorganize? And that can be done only legally. And that can be done by actually taking action or maybe giving advice. Uh, there are so many I've just given those bits. Of course, now, of course, now and then I'm saying that we've got a fuel shortage. The fuel shortage is arising from the fact that we have got a shortage of foreign currency. And, and now we have got obligations. So much of the foreign currency that actually we earn in Malawi is uh, used to repay these loans, uh, actually, I'll say useless loans. Um, now, because initially I talked about uh, two modes of uh, development, uh, economic development. So there is the state intervention and um, the, uh, 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 the neoliberal. Uh, I'm not an economist, so those terms I'm using them as a lawyer, not as an economist, but I, I, I'm using them as the coming across them as a lawyer because the law does not operate in a vacuum. The law operates in different fields, whether science, economics, and, and, and the like. So uh, uh, we have to get back to say, maybe perhaps when we leave everything to the, uh, 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 we leave everything to the private sector, which actually the majority of it depends on the government for business. Uh, unlike in the past, we had companies that were doing business with each other. There were companies that belong to government. Perhaps we need to reorganize and go back to say, perhaps let's see what went wrong. Um, in the past, and then uh, look at our policy and then tailor that policy with the law. And this is the law of the attorney general. Uh, and what I'm saying is that we cannot be a country that can prosper if we don't uh, properly look at the policies that we pursue and tailor those policies with the law. And then of course, have proper institutions to implement those laws that uh, are enacted by parliament. As I said, those laws pass through my office. Um, yeah, so I think in brief, this is what I would say, that we need to go back to say, uh, perhaps there's a lot of things that are happening. And the belief that I have is that, yes, we can have uh, people that actually are uh, uh, negligent in managing our resources. They say criminal offense to, neg to, to, to negligently uh, uh, manage public resources. But at the same time, if there's a way of recovering from those people that never had intention actually to steal, but they are negligent in uh, managing the public resources, uh, the way to recover them, we need to do that. And then this is the, what I, I'm doing and actually I'll keep on doing. Uh, there are examples, of course, of cases that were handling auction holdings limited. We know it was a, auction holdings a subsidiary of ADMAC. Um, but then we'll see that uh, what has been happening is that uh, there was mismanagement and reporting as if they were making profits and then also going to uh, government for bailouts. Um, and then, the, you know, that's the auction holdings uh, manages the uh, uh, tobacco sales. And they are saying that uh, tobacco is the backbone of the economy. Uh, then, of course, ADMAC itself. Um, I'm told that uh, for six months, ADMAC was getting salaries from Treasury and that they could not even make a one million quarter a week until they are closed. Like, so we need to look at that and then properly pursue cases against those that were mismanaging and recover. Uh, we have, of course, um, cases against those that were uh, 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 mis mismanaging. I'm saying mismanaging, they also got some money and invested. The cases that were filing in court. Uh, then, of course, recently we have got the loans board where those that were managing loans uh, for students in the higher education, 80% um, of that money went into uh, uh, pockets of individuals. 
and 120% was the actually utilized for the payment of loans. So there are those recoveries, of course. Uh, then, of course, they are, they are said that uh, Traditionally, people have been looking at the best way to uh, deal with uh, mismanagement or criminality or theft and like is by uh, instituting criminal proceedings. So I say, well, let's complement. Apart from criminal proceedings, um, let's also do civil proceedings. And then actually the Siri Bastard's case is an example of how swift civil proceedings are. If we are to do criminal proceedings, we would have been talking about uh, taking five, six, seven, ten years, and then actually with no prospect of recovering those things. Um, and then I said, whatever my office is doing uh, is with an eye towards either social development or economic development. And then let me stress that you cannot have a country that can prosper if there is a poor rule of law, if people don't respect the law, if you have got weak institutions to implement the law. So that's the duty of the attorney general, to ensure that the institutions are strong enough to ensure that uh, there is a rule of law. Uh, some of you are in England, and you know how um, the law is used, in fact, to propel uh, development, whether social or economic. Some of you are in, in uh, I've traveled to US, I've traveled to uh, England, I've also stayed there. So I know how people are there, um, respect the law, how the law is implemented. Also, I think, as I said, I didn't prepare any written speech. And I, don't, I didn't see any need of preparing a written speech because uh, where you say you are doing these things uh, day in and day out, uh, you leave it. Even if you wake me up uh, at night, 3 a.m., 4 a.m., say, say, tell us what you're doing, what you have done, what you intend to do, I'll tell you without actually preparing notes. Thank you so much. Thank you very much, Honorable. The Honorable, the Attorney General, I learned that this evening that you use two Z's in your title. Um, at this yes. point, I'd like to hand over to my co-hosts, Dr. Sulamoyo and Dr. Kamwana, even though I can't see them. I hope they're still here. Uh, I am Aronet, Dr. Kamwan is on. All right, over to you. Thank you, Dr. Nsusa. Um, thank you again to the Honorable, the Attorney General uh, for your remarks. Uh, at this stage, we're going to go into the question and answer session um, of this uh, interface. And um, I would ask that uh, uh, when we call to those that are attending this interface, if you have a question, to please be concise uh, with your question so that we can get to as many questions uh, as we can. And I, we will try to take maybe three questions at a time, uh, if that will work, um, uh, Honorable Attorney General. Uh, if not, we can take one question at a time. Um, I'd like to maybe begin with uh, the first question uh, that was uh, sent earlier. And then, I'll, and then I'll take some questions from the audience. The first question, uh, and this is of course not being of um, having any legal training, but uh, an observation can be made uh, that Malawi is unlike other countries out here in the diaspora, where if you're poor, the justice system has the propensity to mete out stiffer sentences or punishment as opposed to those individuals who are well off. A uh, case in point would be the marijuana case involving the young man uh, versus, uh, I believe, the managing director of Castell and others who have received uh, lesser sentences. Uh, there are other examples uh, of someone who may have stolen a chicken uh, getting a stiffer sentence versus someone who has defrauded government perhaps getting a lesser sentence. I think the question is, um, is there any interest in justice reform uh, to ensure that the dispensation of justice is carried out equitably, regardless of socioeconomic status? Uh, that's the first question. Um, I will go to... Uh, is it, may I suggest that I take uh, each question as sure. it comes? Please proceed. Yeah. Uh, thank you. Yes, uh, the, this uh, Musa, is it Musa case? Uh, the one that attracted a lot of publicity. Um, okay, uh, I, I, I'll 
uh, let me start by saying that uh, there are sentencing guidelines that the courts uh, uh, formulated in terms of uh, possession of these uh, dangerous drugs like marijuana or uh, Indian hemp. So uh, the sentence will also go with the quantities. So if one has um, a small quantities of Indian hemp, uh, that person will likely go away with a fine. So if the quantities are huge, that person maybe may also go with a sentence, maybe a custodial sentence. And then it also goes, so if one has maybe two tons, three tons, and like so the sentences are imposed that way. But I think those that uh, say that uh, there is uh, some disparities, they may also have a point. But I think the, what is also more important is also maybe to also look at uh, the quantities of Indian hemp for that uh, managing director of Castel. Um, I think it's something that uh, perhaps uh, those that uh, say that uh, maybe justice looks at the face, so those are way off, they also go out with, uh, I mean, uh, they are treated with kid, kid gloves. Uh, I think that there's a point, there's a point there, but uh, what is also key is that we also need to review uh, those actual cases to see how much quantities did this person have. But maybe perhaps uh, we also felt as a Minister of Justice, we may also have uh, done a review of the file and see whether the punishment imposed on the Castell managing director uh, was appropriate in circumstances regarding to the quantities that he possessed. Um, and, and then, of course, these are things that we're also looking at. Uh, there will there'll be situations where perhaps the DDP, when he takes a case to the court, uh, there's an appeal. The DDP will say, oh, yeah, yeah I agree, the sentence was harsh. Um, uh, the sentence was bad and bad. So maybe you also consider those factors that if you possess one gram, five grams, you're likely going not to be given a custodial sentence. It will be it be a fine. But if you maybe have got one ton, five ton, you're using it for commercial purposes, you're likely going to get a custodial sentence. That is how I can attempt to uh, answer that question. But I think there's a point that let's look at it, uh, see whether uh, indeed the, these disparities are properly backed by law, or if there's need for reform, that reform should be done. Thank you. Uh, let's go to Your Excellency, Madame Esme Chombo. And then we'll go to Reverend Chance Montali next. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, and thank you, Attorney General, for this opportunity to interact with us. I have, well, I'll try to be as brief as possible, but I think I, I would like to see your responses on maybe one or two issues. Thank you that your office is also responsible for do, due diligence. And I was wondering whether we uh, we have done enough on um, the reptile um, rutile mines and mkango mines. Have we done enough due diligence? And I think during the week or the last last week or so, we heard about um, uh, the issues that are going on with uh, the uranium, uranium mines. I don't know what's going on there, but uh, I think there was some uh, prohibition that they should not go ahead with the mining or resumption of yeah. mining. And we hear of so many uh, minerals that are being, um, I don't know what word to, to call it, but it's like uh, our minerals are being removed from Malawi and we don't seem to be doing anything. There was a time that I reacted, a lady came here from Zambia and she was selling rubies. And actually she told us that the biggest and the best rubies were from Malawi and they're yeah. the most expensive. So she said, Malawi has not put things in place. And so when they come to sell to me, I just buy and I sell them under the name of Zambia. What are we doing about you know, those? And uh, we hear of gold, we hear of what is it that is going on? Because 
I think that um, we are letting our chances slip by our fingers. So that one is a question on uh, due diligence. The second one is uh, we've had a lot of arrests, especially blue collar, case, blue collar cases, but we don't seem to have um, the same momentum in prosecution. Do we have enough lawyers on the ground to prosecute the cases? Do we have the right quality of lawyers? Do we have enough judges? I know the judiciary has now gone into different um, sectors, revenue, blue collar uh, crimes and so on, but do we have the type of lawyers in your office that will help to prosecute these cases? And um, all the cases that are coming through the ACB and so on, would you not, and I'm saying this without any interest since I'm no longer in the judiciary, but would you not consider maybe hiring some of the retired judges? And I know they are great minds, maybe for specific cases or case by case. I know, you know people like um, Justice, uh, Lord Justice Nirenda, uh, Lord Justice Tue, Chipeta, who are, you know, experts in their own fields and especially criminal law, would you not consider doing that so as to help to beef up the, what is already on the ground because people are looking for results. And so when cases take long, people lose interest. And I think that maybe there's something um, that is not proper that is going on. And sometimes they think that, uh, or Amuhonga or whatever is happening. So I had these uh, views in mind and uh, I would love to have your responses on that. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you so much. Uh, those are very pertinent questions. Uh, I think uh, let me start with the, the first question about the minds. Um, I think first of all, I think it's accepted that we are poor where we are because we don't generate enough foreign currency. We export more, we import more and export less. So without uh, foreign currency, no country can develop. And I said at the back of what I do is either if there's this thing that is pursuing social development, let me do it. If it's about economic development, let me do it. So for example, I, 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 in my office now, I've got three what they call mining development agreements. Uh, there's one by, uh, with Lotus, and the other one, um, Kango, there's a Songwe in Palombe, yeah, uh, Rare Earth, uh, for Rare Earth. And there's another one by Global Metals uh, in Mzimba. So these are in my office. And they have taken more than uh, six, maybe more than uh, four months with, with me in my office. I'm about to finalize one with Global Metals. And uh, this week, I'm supposed to send it to uh, 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 to send it to Ministry of Mines uh, for further uh, uh, feedback uh, on what my observations. So what I've seen is, for example, there's one I will not mention, where the investor is looking for a tax holiday of 20 years. I met them in my office and I asked them, what's the lifespan of this pie? They said 18 years. And then they're looking for a tax holiday of uh, 20 years. Yeah. Then secondly, there is a, uh, they are also saying we want to have our accounts um, offshore. Yeah. So accounts offshore. So why are accounts offshore? The exchange contract, the regulations require that any export proceed has to come to Malawi before it's sent back. You know. And then uh, you, they are also looking for so many. You know where I go to ask. Other, I said, you know, you have got laws that you can utilize if you want to enjoy benefits. There's an export incentives, the export processing zone, which you can utilize. You cannot begin to be asking for tax holidays. And then they're also asking, for example, that they should be paying 1.5% uh, uh, royalties when the, the minimum is 5%, you know? So, so many things that I've observed. And then, of course, uh, what I've done is that true fault. 
that I've looked at the, these uh, uh, MTAs, the Mining Development Agreement, but we also need an independent eye. Maybe I may be uh, uh, subjective. So uh, there are two investors have agreed that uh, uh, independent uh, lawyers from the UK should reduce some of these agreements that are going to pay. And if that's something that I didn't know that it would cost more than 300 uh, US dollars to do that for each MDA. Um, there's, so, there's so many things. And then you see an investor comes in from outside the country. I said that no country can develop without Forex. And then for us to get Forex, for those exports to come back to Malawi and for those people to be taxed properly. So the investor uh, comes to Malawi he registers himself in the Netherlands, and then he goes, uh, uh, opens a subsidiary in Mauritius, and then these, these uh, uh, tax havens, uh, uh, the, the ones that uh, actually they promote the tax havens. And then of course, in the agreement, what I've seen is that they say they want to have uh, uh, a provision where management fees should be taken care of. So, so do I know. How do you say there should be management fees? We know how a company is established. There's a board, there's management, there's employees. So what kind of management fees are you talking about? So these are the things when I'm saying the uh, areas that I've um, actually supported and I'm saying that they are doing a due diligence. If there's a mistake, that will be a mistake of judgment, not that it's intentional. So uh, they looked how deep all this and the same, of course, the MD has not come to me as yet. But I think if it comes well, by MJ, I'm referring to mining development agreement. So it does not yet come to me. So I think it's an opportunity for us to develop as a country. Now talking about uranium in Kalonga, do you know that that uranium was discovered in the same 70s and the uh, government sponsored the exploration of the uranium deposits in Kalonga. Uh, but do you know that uh, there was no, uh, geological information in the Ministry of Mines and, uh, and, and Mining. And that uh, uh, party had to go to the company that was contracted by government to uh, uh, explore for uranium and bought, paid millions of dollars for that geological debt. And in that agreement, they had agreed that from the sales of the uranium, 25% of the uranium, of the, the, the sales uh, should go to this company in, in England. And also, do you know that how Paradigm was formed? No, this is a company from Australia. It goes to Netherlands, uh, and then also goes to uh, uh, Namibia, and then and, and Mauritius. When you see that kind of structure, know that this is a Doge company. They want are here not to help us. They are here to actually steal from us. So these are the areas when I'm reviewing, doing the due diligence over these mining development agreements. These are the areas I'm looking at. And I'm talking about the rubies. That's where last week uh, or some two weeks ago, there was some company in Egypt uh, reached out, of course, to the government officials. And then, they, uh, and then I came to know about that. So, oh yeah, we want to supply the trials at Malawi, but we want to exchange it with rubies. So, no, so rubies is a big business. And then what I'm told as well, from the case that we're handling against Colombia Gem House, and that case is live. Uh, it's live. Uh, that's my assurance, and, and we're doing going very well. Um, uh, the information that I have is that there are only two countries that produce rubies. So there's Burma and Malawi. So the best rubies come from Malawi. And the prices of rubies in Malawi are 50 times higher than the price of diamond. You know? So, and, and then of course, when I talked about the laws uh, in my introductory remark, that it's not enough to have laws, but also need to have institutions. So institutions have to be strong. It's not enough to have institutions with people uh, about the quantity and like, uh, but we also need to have quality uh, people manning those institutions. So where you see that people are smuggling the rubies and then they are exporting it as if it's coming from Zambia is to do with weak institutions. Because we have got, uh, for example, the Reserve Bank of Malawi should be interested in the exports. Uh, I believe they have the department of the court, the foreign force monitoring department. So they have to have interest in exports. Malawi Revenue Authority, they have got a department called the export. I think they've got even a commission for exports. So they need to have to be keen and say, okay, how do we track uh, smuggling of our precious 
you know, actually when I was at the Reserve Bank, I prosecuted a case where somebody was smuggling gold and it was only 14, was it 14 kg or 14 something like that, 14 kg. And then they said, 14 kg, I could hold it in my hands. And they said, this, this is worth 378 million crash. And that was in 2017, you know? So that means that we have gold here. And when I talk to the people in the mines, the department said, oh, we have got original gold and drug, but you know, there's gold in Malawi. But of course, where we know that we have got rubies, we have got sapphire, what is white earth, we call it sapphire or sapphire. These are so precious. And that pressure that we have got the interest, we are saying, oh no, you're looking for fertilizer. No, just give us rubies, then we'll give you uh, 400,000 metric tons of fertilizer. Just so organize yourself and that, you know? So what is key is the, uh, we need to have, maybe if there are imperfections in the laws, improve on the laws. And if I've got weak institutions, let's improve. Maybe they have corrupt people, let's fight corruption. Because maybe people have corrupted. And some of these things they go through the airport. The gold thing that I prosecuted was gold that was about to be smuggled from the airport. So there could be some elements of corrupt behaviors in the airports doing that. You're also talking about uh, uh, your excellency, Chombo, about uh, having judges uh, that retired. I know that they are very capable judges, brilliant judges. Um, I think where you say, this is actually a, a misuse of resources. So we're suffering in the needs of plenty. But perhaps what is required, which we need to consider, is for us to bring them back, yeah, we need to actually to have a law. Uh, in place. But now that the retirement age is 70, perhaps we can say, okay, these people are still under the age of 70, they can still be reappointed as judges. So it's something that maybe we can we'll discuss internally and see how this, this can be implemented and, and then we'll go forward. Uh, now, uh, Your Excellency Chomboy also mentioned about the um, problems of um, uh, arrest and then, of course, no prosecution. Uh, we don't have enough lawyers, but even then, it's one thing to have numbers, but also another thing to have quality. Um, and then, of course, for you to train a lawyer, it will take some time. So there's a lot of uh, turnover in government. Your lawyers will work for two years, one year, three years, and then they leave and for greener pastures. So that's a huge, huge problem. And then, of course, perhaps if you hire external lawyers, they will charge the moon. So they will charge you one... Uh, let's say one, 500 million kwacha, 400 million kwacha, I think for, to prosecute a corruption case for the SF for 50 million kwacha. And like, you know, so these are also the problems that uh, I think have been encountered in the thing of uh, prosecuting corruption cases. But what I would say as well is that when you see a corruption offense occurring, it means that there's a problem here. Because in terms of corruption, I know that there are two pillars, uh, prevention pillars and enforcement pillars. So uh, enforcement pillars will only come in when prevention has failed. So if somebody is inequated, immunized, and then of course, we don't expect that person to forsake. So what we need actually is that there should be proper controls uh, that corruption should not take place. You know? uh, when corruption takes place, one is arrested, there's failure somewhere else. Uh, but of course, then of course, we also need to prosecute. So prevention, as I said, is better than cure. So we need to also to have strong institutions that should be there to prevent the occurrence of corruption. I said, you know, in the past, when I was in the village, we had to go to what a crimp, uh, Valabao and the like, I said so somewhere else when I was doing a public lecture, uh, these were the government institutions that were doing government projects. And they were quick, every year my village was being graded. You know, this time around, because you are saying, no, state should not intervene in these things. We privatize doing these things and right. Then of course, I've created another problem now, corruption. So even whether you go to those that control with a public procurement and disposal of assets act, the procuring entities, and then all those delays and like. So these are things that we also need to also to work out uh, and like. So uh, we're talking about corruption. Is what do you call him, uh, Your Excellency, my lady, uh, Esme Chombo, uh, broke all crimes, or what we call quite core crimes. Uh, but then these things are done in secret. You know, for one to be caught, uh, it means that maybe perhaps some, somebody came on and, and actually spilled beans, or maybe perhaps were they strong enough to do that. But what is key as well is that if we have got uh, strong administrative safeguards, strong internal controls, we'll be able to prevent this. Uh, uh, corrupt behaviors, and then these financial crimes cases will be actually 
maybe perhaps we'll be talking about what is happening in other jurisdictions where we've got very few cases of corruption. Now, talking about due diligence, you know, there is this recent procurement of the Trizer from England and that. When you look at this, you know, I checked, I'm pursuing this case, you know, there's a, a company in the US. When I did my own due diligence, this company that they paid has over five lawsuits is trading in junk debts, you know, uh, and, 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 and that uh, 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 the, the person that they own in that company in the US uh, is a renowned uh, crook and like, you know. So if you are talking about, and that's related to the due diligence of a mining companies, you also also need to look at the directors in those mining companies as well, at least Doge as well. And so my due diligence also extends to that. And then of course, when also looking at, perhaps you can say, okay, this person has been corrupt, but perhaps this person has been negligent, has not been able to properly do a due diligence over the transaction. But due diligence is not only about looking at the illegal structure and the like, but also, uh, the business due diligence, the financial due diligence on that. So these are things that are lacking in the institutions that actually are supposed to help us, whether to pursue development goals, uh, economic development goals, or social development goals. Uh, I hope uh, your excellence have answered your question. Thank you. Thank you. You have answered it. Uh, you have answered the questions, and uh, we, we we are looking forward to more interaction. I see that. Uh, I think we need a lot of time because we yes. also need to talk about the Forfeiture Act and uh, how that comes in and all that. But uh, I see that there's yeah, so yes, many yes, 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 yes. I can talk about the Forfeiture. You know, when we are pursuing about this business that I'm pursuing. Um, two days ago, I was in court. Uh, was it two days ago? Yes. Uh, in, Two days ago, well. uh, yeah, two days ago, Thursday, I was in court about the forfeiture of process of crime. So we are pursuing the civil forfeiture. I am one of the people that would say that perhaps let's try this, uh, the civil route, because it's provided for under the law. So we are pursuing so many cases of forfeiture of uh, uh, process of crime. I don't know whether my, your excellency, this is the angle that you're looking at, that uh, perhaps uh, if people are allowed to benefit from the process of the criminality, process of the crime, then we forget about fighting corruption. Even when this person is sent to jail, we will send, he will look at it as a course of doing business. I spent five years, my children will, uh, will enjoy, and then when I come back from prison, I'll find the money, and then I will live like I'm in Las Vegas, whatever, or uh, these rich countries, places. Thank you very much, Attorney Jeno. Thank, Thank you. I think I'll give opportunity to the other people that have questions. If there's time at the end, I will ask more questions. Thank you very much for now. Thank you. I'll take one question from the audience and then I'll take one from the chat. So, uh, Reverend Mutali, again, let's, uh, everybody, please, let's be as concise so that we can get to as many questions. Right. Thank you for the time and opportunity. Um, first of all, let me also thank um, Tabo Chakaka, uh, mm -hmm. the Attorney General, for the time accorded to us to be able to hear, um, you know, some of the questions that we have. And I do know, probably let me put it this way before I even put my question across, I do know that we don't have much time in terms of, I mean, there's lots of hands that have been lifted up. Hopefully we can have another time where you can come back to be able to elaborate some of these things. It's yes, difficult yes. probably. I do. I, I I look at it. I'm thinking it's difficult for you to handle each and every question that comes in. But whatever you give us, um, really appreciate. Can I start by also saying that you know um, the hope of a nation is is really um, on you and the people that we have elected in, in in government. And so I want you to know that all these questions we are not against you, but we are definitely for you. Um, we're proud of you. We know what you're doing and the effort you, that you put in. We, we, our cry is that whatever is needs to be pushed, let it be pushed um, so that we have a better Malawi. Everybody's crying for a better Malawi. My question is this. The other day I had a, a chart. I have a program, I host God Church and Politics, and I chatted with one of the uh, former judges, I should say, um, Dunstan Mongolu, who's retired now. He's in the UK with his wife. And one of the yeah. things that he spoke about in terms of the cases that come to court, he says, I advise in his remarks, he says, I advise that government take those 
uh, cases, not to high court, but let them bring them before the magistrate. I want you just to shed light in this. It says, according to him, high court are going to dilly dally. He's trying to really get themselves paid in this. Well, magistrate don't have anything to lose, according to his argument. What is your say in that in that uh, aspect? But also, I think if I was to um, add on what uh, the honourable lady um, spoke in terms of um, you know hiring, you know bringing back the judges that we feel they can contribute to uh, to make these cases because there are some some cases that we, we I feel I could be a, uh, I could be a witness. I mean, we're talking about the TPI and somebody has, has asked in the in the comments the TPI and one which, you know, during the time of APM, somebody messed about with this, dragged into court. We don't see the fruit of it. And what does it take? Um, even for, like you said, certain institutions, um, there's a lot of lawlessness going on. What is your department doing to really bring everyone to, to the rule of law? Because this is something that if Malawi is going to progress and prosper, we need everybody to practice it. What, does you, what is your department doing to bring that every institution is under or guided by the rule of law? Um, maybe I'll, I'll, I'll stop there. Yeah, yeah. So your question is, uh, yeah, I'll start with your comment about what uh, Justice Dustin Mangulu said that uh, perhaps the best way is to take this cases to the Magistrate Court. I would agree as a practitioner myself. I've been a defense lawyer myself, and I was also have been a prosecution attorney myself. Um, what uh, also what happens is that it depends on the complexity of the cases. Uh, the cases that are complex are the ones that are taken to the high court. So the cases that are less complex, they are the ones that are handled by the magistrate court. So it also depends and uh, also because uh, sometimes, you know, the magistrates, one will be a magistrate or one will be one that has just uh, uh, <coughs> graduated from, from the university. So it may not have that much better appreciation of the things. And you know, you have got the experienced lawyers, uh, these uh, white collar crimes who have money and will be able to hire the best lawyers in the country. Uh, they, they can be bullied, whatever, and like, and then we have got a, a prosecutor who is less experienced, who make, make mistakes, and like, and then they also tend to delay cases. But, but Dustin Mango would also be right to say, it will be improper to load uh, these uh, cases in the High Court, even with the creation of the Financial and Economic uh, Crimes Division of the High Court, um, it is somehow right. But uh, uh, my feeling is that uh, the Financial Crimes Court is going to handle those complex cases and also handle appeals from the Magistrates Court. Um, and then not. otherwise, if we say that each and every case should be handled in the Financial Crimes Division of the High Court, then we'll also be creating a problem. We don't have enough judges, as the uh, Excellency Chombo alluded to. Uh, we have a lot of magistrates, but we have got few judges. Um, then, of course, coming to the question, what is your office doing uh, to ensure that these cases, you alluded to the TPI uh, in case, and that is delaying and like, uh, I, I know that uh, the, for example, the Director of Public Prosecutions under the Constitution acts operates under my direct supervision and direction. I can give specific direction to say this, this is what is supposed to happen. And then also, uh, there are so many law enforcement officers because the TPI case, TPI case is also handled by um, the Malawi Revenue Authority. Now and then, I've been giving them guidance and I was actually trying to say this is how best this can be done. And, and perhaps, of course, it's good sometimes to sacrifice other key persons because that case will be concluded faster. But then, of course, in the TPN case, we we're talking about not a small amount of money. It's over six billion kwacha that is involved there. So when we're pursuing that, that's what I've been saying, that uh, we should not just look at uh, getting these people in prison. We should also be looking at recovering the monies that are lost. And uh, when we're talking about six billion, that's not this year. The six billion that's some years back. So that recovery should not just be with that uh, principal amount, the recovery should be with interest. So if these people go to uh, property, those properties should be forfeited to government. Uh, the law allows that, the penal code allows that. Uh, you can recover from the property during the, the uh, convicts. So yes, of course, I uh, note the frustration, uh, but I think there's something that has been done. And I think with the, uh, that collaboration that we are having, 
I think this case is going to be concluded uh, soon. But I said, these are the people that will have actually the best lawyers in the country. And then of course, the, we have got these capacity challenges. And what we're doing now is to have also private lawyers in the private uh, law firms to also help in it, uh, prosecuting these cases on behalf of government. Thank you. I hope Before... I've answered your question. Yes, you have. Thank you very much for your time. Thank you. Before I go, next will be Nicholas Tinder, but I got to ask a question from the chat. And it starts with a statement uh, by thanking you for tackling the aspect of economic well being and the efforts that are in place to try and use legally accepted mechanisms and schemes to have it uh, stabilized and restored. The question is in your space, how comfortable are you with the impact in which governance and accountability institutions are making in these efforts? Uh, the examples given would be the National Intelligence Bureau, Anti-Corruption Bureau, Financial Intelligence Authority, et cetera, to mention just a few. What more needs to be done in this endeavor to get a mark where the nation expects? This question is from Dr. Patson Puntambil. Oh, yeah. <laughs> it's a bonded question, uh, but a pertinent question. Uh, what should be done uh, uh, for these institutions, governance institutions? And then, of course, we'll go back to say uh, there's a reason why these institutions exist. And I think the reason is we've got a lot to play in the economy. Um, we, I alluded to the capacity constraints. So one thing that needs to happen is to have that uh, uh, enough personnel, not just the quantity, but the quality. But I say the problem is that uh, there's too much high turnover uh, from government uh, in government. Uh, it may be perhaps because of the low pay and the like. So uh, uh, then, of course, training uh, needs to be done. Uh, without uh, proper training, uh, uh, I think of the people that are supposed to discharge their responsibilities, uh, we will not be able to achieve what uh, we are supposed to do. Um, but it's one thing, actually, as I said, uh, to have an institution and another thing to have that institution tick. Uh, perhaps what you also need to do is that, I know in private practice, uh, in the private sector, you have got these things about uh, the assessment, uh, I think by the end of the quarter, by the end of the year, and like, so we need also to be doing these assessments to say, okay, uh, you were employed here, specifically in individual assessments. For this month, what have you achieved? <clears throat> um, two months out of the year. What I can tell you is that every week uh, in my office, I require my officers to bring reports for what they've done the previous week and what they are trying to do or planning to do the following week. And then also track to say, okay, what you told me, have you done it? How far have you done? But what is also key is also that of collaboration. Because there is one thing that we have talked about these governance institutions in terms of accountability mechanisms and the like. Of course, reporting back is one way of achieving that accountability. And then, of course, accountability, even with those individuals employed in those institutions, to actually telling their bosses and even the nation about what they were employed to do and what they have done. Um, I think that would also help. But I understand the frustration that uh, perhaps, but I think maybe you need to have some patience. Um, one, maybe a few months to come, there will be some results um, achieved. Thank, thank you. Um, I'm going to go to Nick Tindua and then I'll go back to the chat. Nick. Uh, thank you very much for giving me this opportunity so I can ask you uh, the Attorney General a uh, question that really bothers me most of the times. Uh, my question is um, more like what Honorable uh, Chombo asked already about uh, the justice reforms in our country. I understand um, the white people when they were in Malawi, um, they had some laws that they were targeting black people uh, to punish them. Like if you steal, let's say, bicycle, uh, Jovala, uh, they were giving you a long time, let's say six years, 10 years for that. But it seems like they haven't done much or the governments uh, in our country, they haven't done much because it's still happening. For example, if you steal from someone, let's say a bag of men's or a mobile phone, they can easily give you six years, sometimes eight years, we have seen that. But if you notice as well, someone who has been, let's say stealing um, 
uh, from the taxpayers' money, millions, they can easily be given, let's say, two years, three years. So I would like to ask the Attorney General, when are these reforms coming to our country? Because I feel like it's not fair uh, to the common man. Uh, especially, let's say, in other countries, uh, if you steal from the taxpayers' money, let's say the money meant for the hospitals, for the schools, they punish you, even if you steal just, uh, let's say, um, less amount, like in the UK, there were some MPs who were claiming lots of, uh, were claiming more than they were, more than they, ex they expected. <laughs> like, just claiming 10 pounds more more than what they were expected to claim. But since it's taxpayers' money meant for the hospitals or for the bridges somewhere, they were, they were taken to prison and they took it so seriously. Comparing to someone who can steal, let's say, a mobile phone to, from someone who, I mean, for, for, which is a personal thing, they don't take it seriously like the way we are doing it in Malawi that, let's say, you, uh, they put you for a long time for stealing from individuals. Because the way I see it, it's better to punish those who are taking taxpayers' money more than the, uh, those people who steal from the individuals. Because it's just an individual comparing to someone who has got, comparing to someone who is stealing from the public purse. So when do you reckon Malawi is going to sit down and come up with a solution to this kind of problem that they only punish those people uh, who has got, uh, who doesn't have the access to the, I mean, who steal from the individuals? comparing to those who are stealing from the taxpayers. Thank you, Attorney General. Okay, uh, can I take the question? So okay, yes, it's a pertinent observation. Uh, a, a, a pertinent observation, but I think maybe a bit of clarification, um, uh, I think for the sake of the, the audience here. So I'll start with, uh, um, the one that might have stolen uh, a phone. So if we, what we call simple theft, uh, just a chombo, our excellency, just the chombo, uh, bears the sort of me. So simple theft, the maximum penalty that one can get is five years imprisonment with hard labor. But then of course, if you receive stolen property, the punishment is even higher. So if somebody else stole a phone from me, that person will get a maximum of five years. But then the course will not impose five years. But if you have seen somebody else being uh, sentenced to eight years for stealing a phone, it means that that person stole a phone through robbery. Maybe perhaps they used a gun, they used violence, a knife and like so, or they burgled a house. So they burgled and theft. So they have broken into a house and stolen it. So burglary, the maximum sentence is life imprisonment. Robbery also as well as life imprisonment. So then the course will give him eight years on drive. So that's a clarification. The other thing is that for a bicycle, for example, uh, a bicycle, you know, uh, maybe even 20 years ago when I was living in the village, those that had bicycles, I mean, they were rich people. So, so it, it, like a, a worth, a source of worth. So for example, a bicycle for somebody else in the village would be like an airplane for somebody else, you know, or a, a, a VX or a, a Mercedes Benz for somebody else. That's why there are those stiffer punishments. But then coming back to stealing from government, I think you're reminding me in one of the submissions when I was prosecuting a case, I was saying that, uh, oh my Lord, yeah, I think a meaningful sentence should be imposed here. Here, this is theft from us all, because this is unlike from theft from an individual, let's say for me, but this theft will affect not only the accused person, it will affect the entire nation. And like, so that's what happens to when people steal from government resources. Um, and you're right, but I think maybe more should be done because the target now is only with those that uh, work in government. For those that work in government, so for theft by public servant, depending on the amount, the maximum sentence is uh, life imprisonment. Maybe the sole is that if there is money involved, that person, if he's not working in government, can be charged with money laundering, where he can get a maximum sentence of life imprisonment. But at the house, of course, the wheels of justice are slow. And then, of course, there are those complications. Maybe evidence may not be properly gathered. And then so many bottlenecks that will also prevent these cases from being concluded. But we are right that I think there's need for reform. We will be a commission that does reform. And then, of course, these laws will come to my desk and then also look at that to say whether they have been done properly. 
and then it could pass on to parliamentary pass. Uh, but I think as that, I want to just wanted to make that clarification to say that if you steal from government, if you're a public officer, uh, you are in charge or in custody of that property, you are, depending on the value and the amount, you are subject, you'll be subjected to a maximum imprisonment term, term of uh, life imprisonment. I think this also was happening um, with the, even during the Kamuzo's time, that was what was happening. In fact, he's stealing for, stealing during Kamuzo's time, stealing 80,000 kwacha would land you a minimum sentence of 14 years. So if you're a public servant, there's a mandatory minimum sentence for certain amounts. So minimum is no negotiation. So the judge will start from 14 years. And then uh, if there's no restriction, if there's a restriction a recovery, then that's when they can impose any sentence, even a suspended sentence. But if there's no recovery, there's no negotiation, uh, the law is there. But what is uh, maybe lacking, because you don't know, is that these laws are really uh, implemented, they are really actually used. Uh, so maybe the last time that we heard somebody else given that centuries, long centuries is maybe some 10 years ago and like, you know, or five years ago and like, but those are there, um, are they uh, equal, similar to the laws that uh, apply in England, by the way, we borrowed laws from England. Thank, thank you, Honorable. I hope I answered your question. Yes, yes, on that one, yes, it's clear now somehow, though it was really troubling me that the cash get, um, uh, people, were, the maximum I could remember was, I think, the others were getting three years, then tomorrow you hear that someone is still something minor from, from a person then getting 10 years. So I was wondering what was happening in our country. That's when I thought maybe we need some reforms on that one that more like targeting yeah, yeah, black yes people. yes i agree that we that one i agree that they reform but i think uh, sometimes there may be a certain, some bit of correction because i've been in the prosecution also as well as in the uh defense as well so theft of uh chicken if somebody else gets a custody sentence uh of course because people want to emphasize the point that people with the minor offenses get to prison. But uh, if you go to Maura and like, you may not see somebody else who has stolen a chicken and been getting there, but maybe stealing of a goat, theft of a goat, theft of a cattle, because that's worth for somebody else in the village. Uh, that's why, of course, the, the, the sanctions, the punishments are, are a bit, would I say harsh, use the term harsh. Um, but uh, you, you go to Maula Mzuzu and like, you may not see somebody else getting uh, 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 in prison for stealing a, a, a chicken. But uh, uh, if that happens, as like I said, it could be, you know, people live with chickens in their houses, some with goats in their houses. So if you bargo a house, if you bargo, that is when you break into a building at night, uh, during the day, they call it housebreaking. So if you bargo a house, you are subjected to a maximum prison term of life. You know, so if you bargo, you steal a chicken, the punishment that you get maximum is life. So they give you five years, six years, seven years of stolen a chicken and life. So they will bargain rather than theft. So we also need to be interrogating. I think there's need also some of some civic education about what is happening. But you are right that uh, the people that are in prison, uh, you rarely see people that are rich in prison. <clears throat> uh, uh, those that steal from us, those that engage in corruption, you rarely see them. It's mostly the people that are poor, and of course, mostly those that engage in violent crimes. That much, you are right. And then, of course, this need to be done. We should acknowledge that perhaps there's a failure. Let's do something. But not the fact that uh, 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 you have people stealing chickens in prison. I think I, uh, in my experience, I haven't encountered that. Thank you, Honorable Attorney General. I'm going to combine um, a couple questions because I think they're asking about the same. So, Mr. Tiwonge Musonda, I will ask one of your questions at this time because I know you've asked a few questions in the chat. Uh, so, why is it taking so long to investigate, charge, and prosecute corruption cases? Uh, when, on the other hand, as you've shared with us uh, today, and as we've seen in the media, you have managed to recover uh, a lot of assets on behalf of the nation uh, since your tenure as attorney general. 
And we know that uh, His Excellency the President uh, has recently assented uh, uh, some bills that have to do deal with addressing uh, issues of corruption, for instance, the establishment of the Financial Crimes Court, uh, as well as the uh, amendment to the Corruption Practices Act. How long should we, how, how long will it take for us to begin to see the fruits of some of these laws that have been recently been enacted? Yes, I, I, I will be frank with you that uh, you don't have, you, don't, you shouldn't expect uh, the force of these uh, new laws um, immediately. But I think in, let's give it some time because uh, now, for example, the uh, Court Act that introduced the uh, Financial Crimes Court, um, the are judges that have been appointed and I hope that they will start uh, getting cases soon. And then of course, for judges to have those cases, they also need cases because they can't go out to hunt for cases. Uh, the case has to be properly investigated. The prosecution has to be ready of the case. So it just starts with the investigation. So I've always said, even when I was handling a case, that where you see an accused person pleading guilty, it means that the investigator has done a really, really tremendous job, a good job. Uh, where an accused person has been not guilty, say, oh, maybe the investigator has not done a good job. So he started with investigation. So the lawyer doesn't do the investigation. Sometimes he can lead the investigations by actually guiding one to areas of investigations of drug, but investigations are done by people that are not really lawyers, but are trained as investigators. So for a case to come before the Financial Crimes Court, they would need to be, it needs to be properly investigated. But then, of course, as I said, uh, these people will also come um, ready with the, the, all the artilleries. They have got a defense counsel, they can hire the best lawyers uh, in Malawi or in, even outside the country. So, uh, so as I said, not that I'm painting a gloomy picture, but I would say that you can say we start reaping the results now. The results, immediate results is that we will start having cases registered in the financial crimes division of the high court. But I think somebody else alluded to the fact that these cases, sometimes they have to come, uh, 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 come from the magistrate's court. Uh, they will come to the high court by way of appeal. So now we shouldn't actually lose sight of the fact that we are going to magistrate's courts that will also be handling those cases. Also, of course, we can have one thing to have a number of judges in the financial crimes court, but it's another thing also to have enough capacity, to have enough uh, prosecution, properly trained prosecution attorneys to handle those cases. But as I said, the financial crimes court is not only going to handle criminal cases, it's also going to handle civil cases emanating from a financial crime. So, uh, you know, uh, civil cases are swift. I was handling a certain case, uh, for example, uh, where I used to get a judgment. I was applying for forfeiture of a process of crime. Uh, it was handed at 7,000 US dollars. So the accused person argued to say, oh, the defendant, not the accused person. In that case, we were a civil case. That I, by these cases, so I need disclosures. I need uh, these people to bring to me a list of the following documents a list of the, these are in position of the state and tax. So these are rights that are given to accused persons. We cannot take them away from them. These are constitutional protected rights. We also have international conventions that we subscribe to, to follow on the rights of accused persons. So this is what they said, I need to do this. So I rose and said, oh, this could be true if it, this was a criminal trial, but this is a civil trial where these things are not supposed to happen. And therefore after this uh, uh, request should be uh, rejected. So the court agreed. The request should be rejected. So yes, of course, some of the cases that you are seeing, the civil cases uh, bordering on financial crime, will be taken to the financial crimes court. But uh, uh, the result, let's start seeing the results. Give it three months. From three months, that's when we go and do an assessment to say have we really achieved what we wanted. Now coming to the actually the uh, recently enacted uh, amendment to the Corrupt Practices Act, uh, I think there's one major amendment that is removing the requirement to obtain consent of the Director of Public Prosecution. So meaning therefore that the Anti-Corruption Bureau will not require uh, consent from the Anti-Corruption Bureau. So we'll just need to see to say which cases have been brought to court 
uh, directory without the need for consent from the director of public education. Then, of course, I would just say that you can say this week or next month, let's give it three months and then work forward. But as I said the Financial Crimes Court uh, has stakeholders. The stakeholders are not only judges, we also have got prosecuting attorneys, we have also defense attorneys. Then we also require at least um, some, um, well, I, the way that's escaped. Somebody used say, some tactics to be used. Because if you bundle so many accused persons, 20 accused persons, 30 accused persons on that, when you can only have three or four accused persons, um, you may not achieve quick results. And then of course, you look at the general picture, what role this accused person played, and then take out, use the others as accused persons. And then of course, you have a quick result. Then that person will say, oh yeah, I've got too much evidence against me, let me plead guilty. And then of course, you have got so many witnesses against you and like, and then you not have so many accused persons coming to testify because if you can the accused persons, each one of them testify, maybe two days, it will mean that uh, uh, you need maybe over a year to conclude that case. Thank you. I'm going to do, take one more question from uh, the chat and then I'll go to the people on the panel. I think Chuck's been waiting for some time. Uh, the next question, uh, uh, Honorable Attorney General, is can the law in Malawi be devoid of politics? Uh, we have seen, I think, there are some cases involving high level politicians that have taken many years to address. Uh, so I won't mention any names, but just to ask the question, can the law be devoid of politics? Yes, it's a good question. Uh, good question. <clears throat> uh, uh, of course, bordered question as well. Can the law be devoid of politics? Uh, I think the example that has been given is that of the cases that have been taking too long involving politicians. I will mention names. I think the Bagiri Muzi case. There is also the Humphrey, uh, the, the the Jumbe and the uh, Jumbe, Friday Jumbe and this Deputy Finance Minister Philip Bonali case that have taken too many years. Um, perhaps, of course, the perception that many politics has crept in and like uh, you know. But this is the 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 cases have taken time is because the accused persons have been taking too many applications, one application after the other, that no, you are violating my constitutional protected right. We are a constitutional democracy, mind you. Uh, or no, I think uh, there are too many charges. Uh, initially, the charges against Mr. Mlozi were 87 in, in total. So no, 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 these are too much. You cannot be charging me with too much, too many charges. Oh, no, 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 this is, uh, uh, I'm sick. I'm what, I think so, so there are so many contributing factors uh, to the delay in concluding of that case, specific case, for example. Uh, I would say that uh, in terms of law, the law it would be devoid of politics, but perhaps, of course, its implementation perhaps, or might be devoid of politics. I'm not saying that uh, politics creeps in, but I think the delays that uh, are being alluded to and nothing to do, have nothing to do with uh, maybe politics. Okay, if it's politics, but it's to do with so many applications. Uh, that have been brought before court. The last application is a judgment that uh, contributed to the day of that case, Moses case, a judgment that just got delivered this year, just imagine. Uh, so that's the issue. And which is why I was saying that perhaps let's also try civil means of recovering this asset. And then the other time I said, perhaps let's try amnesty. I know sometimes somebody else has made his ways of God. He stole maybe billions but uh, then he says, oh, if I go to say that uh, I've stolen, then they are going to send me to, they're going to prosecute me and like, but then these people will have said, I want to repent, I want to pay back, I want to become a preacher man, uh, whatever and like, so I want to repay. And you don't have evidence against him. And this person come forward and like, so if you are asked these means of recovering these money, like, you know, I also gave an example to say, if for example, you have a, a, a precious, uh, 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 your 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 phone, or maybe your your watch has been stolen, and then somebody else says, "Okay, I can pay back uh, the equivalent value of this uh, phone or watch or uh, or jewelry." Uh, would you say that you should prosecute that person, or would you choose to get that uh, jewelry, watch, or phone? So I think that thing to say, "Okay, let's decide: should we proceed by way of criminal prosecution or civil litigation, uh, and then we recover?" And then of course, if it's a criminal prosecution, should we say, okay, instead of this person, 
getting 10 years because he has a restricted fully. Can we say, okay, accept that he, he should get uh, two years or one year? I think these are the things that the measures that can also help go a long way towards actually uh, concluding these so many cases that are uh, uh, clogging the courts so far. I'm sorry to cut in. Um, there's actually a question in regards to that. It says, HE expressed his support for your idea for Malawi to opt for amnesty to some financial cases from the past. He requested that a complete law has to be put in place apart from the bits and pieces of official law. What's the update on that one? Or the update of the complete law uh, to be put in place. I think before I answer that question, the other time I was conducting a lecture, so somebody asked me, a public lecture at the University of Malawi, asked about this amnesty thing. They said, no, this was not backed by law. I, then I asked a question <clears throat> and uh, I said, okay, in school, even in go to investors in England to do masters, you learn about uh, uh, law of thoughts. Do you have a statute of law of thoughts in mind? I said, no, we don't. We, we learn about uh, law of contract. Do we have a statute, an act that can point that this is providing for the law of contracts? Yeah, I know. About law of trust, they don't, apart from maybe other statute, trustees and corporation act and that, you know? So what I said is that uh, this thing about uh, the amnesty that says not backed by law was false uh, because this is the general law of amnesty uh, where actually in practice, we have been practicing that. As a defense counsel, I've done that. As a prosecuting attorney, I've done that. Uh, using that and then people getting forgiven and they maybe tend to witnesses and, and 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 the like yeah so coming to the specific question to say complete law on that there are processes i said there are so many things that are supposed to be done the constitution requires that for a law to be promulgated there is need to be consultations it's a constitutional requirement and there's need to do for uh conversing of expert opinion and like now when i that I talked about the amnesty. It's not something that I just dreamt to say, think about it. I did a research. I actually did comparisons in Germany, Switzerland, Angola, and like these people have done amnesty and they recovered a lot of money. There are billionaires in Germany that actually had stashed their money in Switzerland and other countries. Using the law of amnesty, they will recover the money and drug, you know. So it's something about what people need. Do you need money or you need people to go to prison? So it's a choice, it's your choice, it's just for the people. That if somebody has stolen 20 billion pesos, you choose whether to get 20 billion or choose that that person that has stolen the money should keep the 20 billion uh, and go to prison, spend five years, and then after five years, come back and enjoy that money. So that's a choice that Malayans chose. And because they chose, that's why we had to abandon that one. But I think I stand by that to say that was a very brilliant idea that I did was properly researched by the way, and we looked at comparable jurisdictions and we ought to look at the law that we apply. Thank you. Uh, Attorney General, let's go to Chucks. Yeah, thank you very much uh, for giving me this opportunity. I just have a few questions. Um, the first question is uh, uh, the Attorney General, um, we know that you regret lawyers, see how they are behaving, <coughs> uh, performing in the industry. But I think of late, we've had a lot of cases where judges have been implicated or sort of thought to uh, solicit funds from uh, the criminals and all that. But it's clear that we don't have any regulatory body or if judges are uh, answerable to parliament. Do we have uh, a law in place where judges can be impeached or be brought to parliament and answer um, any sort of uh, cases that are they deem to be uh, doing behind. Um, secondly, is uh, on the repossession of um, companies that we sold by government dubiously. Uh, from 1994, we've seen companies that we just uh, sold uh, dubiously, and uh, the recent one being Malawi Savings Bank, where we don't know where the funds are, we don't know what's happening, and we feel Malawi are being short cheated. Uh, the third one is uh, presidential powers. Um, don't you think uh, the president need to relinquish some of his powers like he promised during the campaign to say he will relinquish uh, appointing powers uh, so that organizations like ACB, uh, NIB, 
and other organizations that uh, he should not be seen as interfering because once he has the appointing power, it means automatically there's a subconscious mind that those appointed in the office, they owe him um, an early, um, um, they owe him something. Um, you can um, see uh, in other spheres where the president is also appointing judges to be in the uh, foreign uh, embassy. Is that not also bringing uh, delay to the justice? Thank you. Thank you. Uh, so let me start with the, uh, do you have uh, a board that regulates the judges? Yes, we have the Judicial Service Commission. Um, and this is provided for under the constitution and the judges that uh, um, are guilty of misconduct can be impeached uh, by parliament. So the law is there, but at, the same, uh, at this point in time, we there's a bill that has been drafted, the Judicature Act, I mean a bill that is actually going to put more powers on the Judicial Service Commission to look, actually investigate and discipline uh, judges. Um, but at the same time, the, we already have a law uh, for the disciplining of judges. The only problem is that people just complain and that they will not even bring any complaint before the Judicial Service Commission. So the Judicial Service Commission cannot, on, cannot act on its own uh, because it cannot be a, a, an, an accuser, cannot a judge and like its own cause. So it has to receive a complaint and uh, actually investigate it. There has to be a complaint. So I don't know what is happening. People are afraid to report to the Judicial Service Commission, and, and that's why we have these uh, problems. So coming to the next question about early possession of companies, um, yeah, you're right. Um, I think the problem is that uh, we know we borrowed too much from what Margaret Thatcher did when she privatized most companies. She wanted to deal with mostly with the strikes by the National Union, but I think this could also work here. And then we foolishly sold the companies and because we had interest. I'd also said that uh, apart from the ones that are mentioning the Malawi Savings Bank, there is also the Malawi Development Corporation where so many subsidiaries uh, were sold. Um, and then of course, subsidiaries of other companies. You know, uh, uh, Malawi Development Corporation, you know, is the one that actually developed the country. You cannot develop a country without these companies, uh, uh, institutions like a, a development bank, like Malawi Development Corporation. So Malawi Science Bank, uh, there's something that is being done, investigation has been carried out. And then of course, some preliminary reports have come to my office. And then of course, the advice to actually beef up some reports, something will be done maybe in the next two or three months or that. Uh, coming to presidential powers, languishing presidential powers, um, I think something that is debatable, but perhaps if you look at the Course Amendment Act, for example, you find that uh, initially the, the magistrates were appointed by the president, but now the magistrates are appointed by the chief justice. That's one way of removing their powers. And then, of course, you recently heard about the uh, roast traffic, the, the roast authority. The board is appointed by the minister, not the president. Uh, same with the Malawi Bureau of Standards. The board is not appointed by the president, it's by the minister. So if you're talking about the president promised uh, reducing his powers, uh, giving up his powers, these are some of the things. But some of the powers are in statutes. And then the president also promised rule of law. So rule of law it mean, means that you have to follow the law. So for a statute, you need to also bring a statute, the amendment to parliament to amend it, to say we're removing these powers. Right? Meanwhile, as we're doing that, uh, the president will have to exercise those powers under the, those, those, those pieces of registration. But there's also a danger in removing all the powers from the president. For example, when there is a uh, fuel shortage, they don't blame that institution, they will blame the president. If there are no roads, they will not blame the, uh, that institution, they blame the president. This, by the end of the day, the president will be answerable in 2025 or in another election. So I think the, I can't pass, uh, I actually I need to be frank here. Uh, something that I would say, okay, as much as the president is trying to reduce his powers, but we also need to look at which powers should be reduced, should be relinquished, should be given up. Uh, those ceremonial powers, yes, but the powers that actually make that president critique. If you're saying that uh, uh, the president should not appoint a board of a particular institution, should not appoint this thing and that, but by the end of the day, you have got a problem, you uh, point finger at the president. Why are you saying? 
But then, of course, you say, okay, you're yeah, appointing an ACB director. The parliament is involved in the appointment of the ACB director because the appointment, even the dismissal, the president cannot dismiss the director of the anti-corruption bureau. If it dismisses, it, the parliament has to get involved um, and so many other institutions. But at the same time, if you're talking about it, the president should not be involved because perhaps this person that is appointed by the president will say is owing allegiance to the president and therefore he cannot do anything against the president. What about if somebody else will say, okay, uh, now I'm going to fight the president who sabotage the president attack. So that counterbalance is also key. It's very important when you're looking at it because by the end of the day, we're saying there's a president because there are some powers. If the president doesn't have powers, then and then it will not be a president. But at the end of the day, there will be problems that will be uh, uh, recurring now and then. And then, uh, and, and then, of course, the blame will go to the uh, president. Uh, president, you promised us this thing. These people promised so many things in their campaigns. We're going to do this, going to do this, and that. They do these things by way of uh, putting people in place that are capable to do those uh, kind of promises, implement those kind of promises. But I think all in all, what I'm saying is that uh, you see now and then the president reducing his powers. And when we are talking about the bills that are going to parliament, wherever there is a power given to the president, then of course there is, that is reviewed and those, that power is given to a board or maybe a minister or some other body to appoint just or to do certain things. Thank you, Attorney General. So the last, uh, the three hands that are up will be the last questions we will take uh, due to the interest of time. So let's go to OPPO A72, and then we'll go to Dr. Rajan Parkin, and then gift Chi Jinsole. Jin Sole. Hello. Yes. You're on mute. Can you hear me now? Yes. Yes. Okay, thank you. Um, hello, my name is Sheila. In the Kungo Funa go Funsa Funso, go la Locusana, Dinma for Sawili, in I am mining you. Godi Mugati Mugachura Zamining, Godi de Rube, the Katun Duanda, and Katun Dua Mala, we capena Katun Dua Mund, and in my private companies are Gamabuela, Imene Seeding at the Ujan, a new form of colonial Antaga. Dimango Kala, Guma Gidan Chido, Guma and Dida Tutambala, and to Amen Alindi Kupan Alindi Machini, Ojo Kera Gunja, Akubela, Gutenga, my billions. Sizinga Tweke Gudi Officiano, Gubele Samara Moro Gudi is into Sika Kalaza, Kuzana Mining in Dagatundua, Malawi, and the Kales, the Kaleza Nation. Kubele sama chani dimati akubele sana antu apunzi sana antu mining antu makobi di otiziri pida ngongole nanga kujokela kujokela kumala we kubida ku UK kabena ku America ukapen pache tandi zoko makumbu yoku dasi ya goli de dasi ya rube tu kubida kuma iko mwe alibe goli de alibe rube kuma alindi ujen ma structures amena magira nchiro ndesi zinga take out office ya noyo. Where is Amala Moro? What is the Kazama inning is? The Katundua Malawi. And the Josejo Banki government upon dramas is the benefit of Malawi. Gadim Malamula men or Sanka, she take a Sukunga Kales or Malamulo and order and to Mugaba Sakama private companies. Yo, Goody Kusogoro, Osangua Pasa, Goody Deo, Kumakumaka, Low, Kumene Kuchoka, Malamulo, does a satira, and a Malawi Kumapita, Kumaka, or not a Malamulo Akusatil. Fonsalachi within the Rokoti. Ngadi tikuna na kuti kunja kuna kuri corruption. Tikuzwa kuti tere ba matipata system. Ma uh, ma government ama bwe kupita five years kupita. Legal system we mango kalabi. Then kadi corruption we kupita high. Amena li ndi vuto ndenda ni malamu and hopanga malamu no kapena aboma. Amena makala five years in kupita. Amena and amena mapanga malamu no makala gambi la gale gale and inchuto yano nde malamu no kawok. That is it for Okay, so I think I'll start with the last question. When uh, the poop was there so high for Malay um, I wouldn't say the high, Kapena, Gomano, of course, the Rigos, which is a perception, and then I would the poop, Kumasangan, and a good lady, much regarding. Gomano problem with the Antrufe, we people, Malawians, because it started with us. So you usually blame the politicians, but the people that you do are the enablers. The enablers are these public servants. Are the, the, the citizens. So these are the ones that actually engage in corruption. 
So there's no corruption that can be done, perpetrated without the involvement of the public servant, the, the employee uh, or the citizen. So I think it starts with us, but also I think as well, because we the systems in place, uh, maybe the systems are weak. But then of course, there's a situation where I said, initially in my introduction, I said that uh, uh, maybe in the past, you know, in one part of the era, there was less corruption because uh, the institutions that are doing business in Malawi, you know, you're talking about private institutions. Those institutions that are doing business, uh, are private institutions, all those that they are call themselves private institutions, they rely on government. So they do business with government. So when we privatize, for example, MDC has so many companies, some of them were engaged in the manufacturing of, of of, of, of stationery, some of them were engaged in the maybe other state owned companies were manufacturing drugs, uh, some were doing road construction and that. So many of them were there. So they were doing business with each other, supplying business with each other. So, so no public institution will corrupt another public institution. Now we have given business to private institution individuals. Yeah. So these individuals, if you want uh, 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 drugs, you buy from individuals. If you want fertilizer, you buy from it. You want to buy stationary individuals. You can buy from government print. You can buy from government what stores, whatever and like, you know. Uh, you can buy from a, 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 a public institution. Like. So maybe what you should do is, uh, we're not talking about the laws. Let's come up with the laws. That should, we should also say that, yes, we have tried uh, this neoliberal system of economy, uh, uh, managing the economy. But let's also try uh, uh, state intervention. And, and that, of course, maybe when we are buying things, let's buy directly from manufacturers. So that's about the corruption aspect. But in terms of the uh, who owns these minerals, it's, it's Malawians. They belong to Malawians. So uh, in the past, we had, I said, the Malawi Development Corporation. Do you know, the first mining company uh, to be established was established by MDC, Mchenga Coal Mine. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Now, when we went to much part, uh, whatever, and that, we privatized it. We sold it and that, you know. So if we were to say, okay, let's do this, we don't have an institution that can go into mining. So if we had an institution like a Malawi Development Corporation, which would go into a large scale infrastructure, maybe investment, whatever, and that, or mining and that, uh, that had capacity, and right, you know, that would happen. But because we killed MTC, so we no longer have capacity to venture into mining. So what we do now, we also had a company, a mining company, I think I'm told, well, belonging to government. So because we don't have the capacity and we resources, we don't have the expertise. That's why we also say, okay, this investor should come in. This is all key because we're talking about international investments. So international investment, because we, for a country to develop, as I said, it needs your foreign cars. So these people bring foreign currency. As much as we can export those products and get foreign currency, but this big investment, when they come here, companies, they come here, they expect to bring their capital in the form of foreign currency. And then therefore that also can contribute to the uh, direct inflows. Uh, that's what the law actually requires us to do. So when these companies come here, what is important is that they should not uh, give us raw deals. The thing is that uh, we want Forex, but they say that they'll be depositing their uh, income in uh, offshore accounts. That won't forex and say, okay, won't tax holidays. Yeah. Oh, yeah, we, uh, we don't want to pay. The one way of actually uh, getting payment from this, that's why, because we own it, that's why we charge royalties. So 5% uh, now, minimum, uh, the royalties that are charged on the uh, uh, extraction of mineral resources and that, but they still belong to uh, you, Marawias. Uh, and that, that is not one way of colonization. Uh, it's called investment. Uh, even in the US uh, or in, in England, you may have companies from China, whatever, investing in England and like, you know? So that's not colonization. But I think what we should do is to properly manage these things, manage agreements, that the agreement should actually uh, benefit both investor and also uh, Malawians. Thank you, Honorable. Let's go to Dr. Rajampagan and then gift Jim, Jim, Jim Sole. Thank you very much for the opportunity. I have two questions and I'll be very brief. I would like to know what are your views on political party funding legislation uh, in fighting corruption, 
And this is with respect to disclosure of uh, sources and so forth. Mm. I wanted to follow it up. My second question is uh, what appears to be a travesty of justice, a caricature, if you will. Uh, I call it a sham in the delivery of justice in the country where bail is used as a get out of jail free card and it has become common practice. What are your views on these two issues? Okay, so I think uh, let's start, uh, we'll start with a question on uh, my views on political party funding. Uh, yes, right to say that that would be one way of uh, promoting corruption. Uh, uh, some people say it creates an incumbulance. So if somebody else has a, a funded uh, a political party who expects a business from that uh, party when it gets into government. Uh, the other time I was saying, maybe perhaps what we should do to get rid of this, we should increase this, uh, you know, when a party is in, in, in government, it has got some MPs above 10 MPs and like is entitled to funding from treasury. So one way of dealing with this is that uh, uh, we can save more actually, that we increase actually the funding that gets to from treasury to these political parties that are eligible. That would be one way of leading of political party funding. This disclosure, I think there's a law, political parties act that you need to disclose all your funding. Uh, in fact, there are some areas where I say, oh, this is now going overboard. That uh, when a politician uh, is going to uh, give a gift, it should not be announced. Or the help at the funeral, not, no announcement and rank. But that political parties act also covers issues of political party funding. Uh, that will also bring some form of accountability. It's a recently enacted law. It is yet, yet to be tested. Um, I think it came into operation very uh, recently, um, but it was, it was not there. But perhaps I think the proof of, of the pudding is in the eating. So we'll see what will happen um, maybe in few months um, to come or when it gets to the next election. But that perception there that uh, this political party funding. So some people, they do, do that with uh, good intentions. They do funding, because funding, funding, provide funding to political parties because they expect business from the uh, that government when uh, that party, when it gets into government. Uh, Bell, that uh, is used as a, uh, a gateway valve for uh, the people that commit crimes. Um, now, we, of course, we are uh, guided by the constitution and also subscribe to international conventions, uh, UN conventions, and, and then uh, the, all those conventions and the constitution say that uh, every person is presumed guilty I mean, presumed innocent until proven guilty. So uh, now, uh, if that is the case, then you can't say that this person, because has been accused of a committing a crime, therefore that person should be in jail until trial is concluded. The only way that person will be in jail is where is a risk poses a risk uh, to the public, uh, or that will risk uh, the, the risk of him voting, uh, running away from. Uh, trial. That's the only time that uh, uh, you have for uh, uh, bills denied. But uh, then they will say, no, I think if you remove this requirement of bail, they we have brought back uh, detention of that trial. So I think these things without need to be avoided. You know, in the past, people were being detained for one of, I think, 20 something years, 10 years, 15 years of that trial. Right? So I think that's why they say, okay, you're presumed innocent until proven guilty. So that's bail is a constitutional right, but constitutional protected right. And then, uh, uh, then of course, under the International Convention. I think I've seen there a chart to say they are talking about post-conviction bails. So these are given in exceptional circumstances uh, under the law that are guided, they are provided for. Uh, but you know that uh, when you're talking about a person getting out on bail, the expectation is that the appeal should be uh, uh, held as soon as possible. So uh, yes, there will be an abuse where one is given bail, pending appeal, and then uh, enjoys his freedom five years, six years, the appeal is not concluded. 
So there, at that stage, that's where I would agree with you to say, no, yeah, I think this now is being abused on that aspect. But I think in the exceptional circumstances or cases, courts have the discretion to grant a bail in deserving situations, even to a convict pending hearing of an appeal. There has to be an appeal, but where you are out of, prison, out of uh, jail for two or three years and like, I think that is what I would agree, that would be unacceptable. Thank you, Honorable. Uh, Dr. Msusa, over to you. Okay, I have two more questions, Honorable. The first one is, could you please give us an update on the recovery of AIP money from Germany? And the last one, um, is there anything you can tell us about the relationship between your office, um, ACB and the D DPP? Have your differences been resolved? Do you now have a working strategy that is helping you work towards the same goals? Those are the last questions that I have. Yeah, let me start with the relationship between the DPP, myself, and the ACB director. Uh, I think when I was doing a public lecture at the Chancellor College, so that question popped up. And the answer that I gave, I said, perhaps you are trying to build uh, a mountain out of a molehill or creating a storm out of a cup of uh, tea. Um, I think me, I just surprised to say, okay, this poor working relationship, how? Now, the fact that there was a, a difference in opinion on one issue and that, that doesn't mean that there's poor working relationship. So to me, there's good working relationship with the DDP, with uh, the anti-corruption bureau. But mind you, we have got so many law enforcement agencies. We have got the Malawi Revenue Authority. We have got the Malawi Police Service. We have got even the uh, these people that uh, okay, we, with the World Life. They also do the law enforcement and 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 so on and so. The working relationship is uh, cordial with all the law enforcement agencies. Uh, so the, the, the first question that I asked was about the update on AIP from Germany. Somehow I alluded to it that uh, there was 181,250 US dollars that was deposited in US, New Jersey, um, uh, and then 516,000 euros equivalent to 543,000. I mean, let me come again, 516,000 euros, um, equivalent to 543,000 on there about US dollars that was deposited in a uh, federal bank uh, of uh, uh, Germany in, in Munich. The other one was in the Chase Bank in, in, in New Jersey. The, uh, yeah, so let's start, let me start with the one in Munich. So the one in Munich, uh, I think the embassy after the, the embassy in the UK, after it was uh, uh, approached somehow, uh, but that was after payment had already been done. It seems that they made a communication from what I gather to the authorities or to the embassy in Germany. Um, from what I got, I, I, I seem that communication was made. But at the same time, the bank in the, uh, Munich, Fido Bank, um, um, issued a suspicious transaction report to the law enforcement authorities in, in Munich. Uh, that account was opened in May 2022, and that deposit was made in June 2022. So the money was frozen. Uh, I traveled to Munich uh, a couple of weeks ago, and there we, I met the uh, Munich prosecutors. Um, so what had happened was that at first, what they wanted, the very same thing that I talked about, the uh, criminal prosecution and the civil uh, litigation. So they wanted that a litigation, criminal litigation should complete uh, before a decision could be made or an application could be made for the money to uh, be repatriated to Malawi. So in my meeting with them, I managed to persuade them that uh, we know that uh, criminal litigation would uh, take a long time. Also considering that uh, we've got people in other jurisdictions and uh, US that will also require some mutual legal assistance and others from Ireland, others from uh, uh, England. And therefore I said the appropriate way was to do a civil uh, forfeiture recovery route 
so are great. Documents were prepared. Um, and and uh, I think I went, at the time that uh, I was leaving Germany, they were about to be filed with the court and that uh, the money for the money to be repatriated to Malawi. But because uh, you know, we're in democracy, they will be need to give the right to the person that she uh, owned that account the right to be held. The name of the person in Munich, his name is uh, Andre Rabon, uh, the one that uh, whose account the money landed in. And this, as said at some point, I was in interview to say that looked like a serious fraud case. Uh, so the other which how that was done, uh, there was a recovery of 1,250 US dollars, and that money is now in the hands of some other farmers revolving fund. But uh, I, I was telling somebody else to say, no, if I don't recover the 516,000 euros, then uh, you have got the, all the right to get me dismissed. So my promise is that uh, all the money will be paid. And of course, you haven't asked that question. Another question that cropped up was that uh, uh, you're spending quite a lot of money because you are going to pay these people in Munich for helping you to recover that money. So this short answer is that because these are prosecutors in Munich, same way you involve prosecutors in Malawi, them any penny, they get paid by government. So there's no money that is going to be paid by Malawi government to the Munich prosecutors. And there will be no deduction from that money uh, from the Munich prosecutors. Right, you know? So that is the update that I would say. And I think somehow I mentioned about when I was asked a question about due diligence, uh, the money in New Jersey was deposited in an account of a company called the Bova Investment Corporation. That Bova Investment Corporation is uh, owned, those that can Google, is owned by Chaudre Solomon. And uh, Chaudre Solomon has been sued uh, by so many people who was involved in junk debt, sale of junk debt. And, uh, and then at some point he was sued uh, in a case where he said he was going to organize uh, uh, the presence of uh, Mayweather and like and, and, and never Mayweather never stand up and like you know, uh, uh, and then of course uh, he, uh, this person child or someone owns so many companies. So that is kind of the background check that I did. I never went to US to do that, but I was able to get that information from here. Um, uh, uh, about this transaction. But if we had done enough done due diligence on that transaction, we would not have lost that money. Um, uh, perhaps uh, this is what I've been telling people to say, at an early stage, uh, you should involve for uh, embassies. So these are key. So these people involved in the embassy, when they had already paid the money, when they are going to the UK to say they want to inspect the federalism in the UK. So if there's a transaction in the US involve the embassy, we are going to the diaspora community that uh, Milaki people contact say, oh, there's this, this can you check for us and back, like, you know? The embassy could be involved and back, like, you know? Uh, so I think that's what we are lacking to say. We're failing to make use of our resources, the available resources it would be cheap. If I ask somebody else from Brussels to say, I want to check on this, this person will be able to check for me. And these people are in the UK, they provided a, a fake address, physical address. That address was uh, owned by uh, a, a, an accounting firm. The phone number that they provided, the phone number, uh, Ambassador is excellent, this will be able to confirm with me. Uh, and uh, uh, the phone number belonged to another company. They could own, these people could only be reachable on WhatsApp. They couldn't even provide a, 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 a website for their business and like, you know. So that is the short update on the recovery of the money from Germany. And I promise if this money is not recovered from Germany, uh, you have all the right that I've promised. You can have me dismiss for failing <laughs> my job. Thank you. Understood. Um, thank you very much. And especially for that last part, it is precisely the reason why we are here. Um, we want to be a useful diaspora. We are passionate about our country and we want to be useful. So in any way that government can use the diaspora, we are there to be used. Um, I'm being reminded that we skipped Jim, gift Jim Sole. I don't know if he's still around. He had his hand raised for a very long time. And also there is one last question that just refuses to go away. What is the latest on the Satar case? So if, G, if gift, 
can please pose his question and then that will be it. Afterwards, I'll call upon um, Patso to come with his um, few words. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much, Attorney General, for a very new self. Uh, I've got uh, three questions. Uh, the first question uh, is about uh, Robert Yasowa case. Uh, we don't know how far this case is, so if you can maybe highlight uh, where the case is. Uh, this is a student who was uh, killed at Polytechnic. Uh, the second question is, uh, what is your department doing with uh, the illegal selling of fuel? I think they can be also one of the leads on that, like is uh, hampering uh, fuel distribution in Malawi. Uh, the third question, uh, it's uh, on cannabis. Uh, what is your department doing on cannabis laws? Uh, as we know that like the Western countries, the one who uh, discriminate uh, the cannabis, they have start now, uh, so they criminate uh, the uh, cannabis, they have now start uh, loosening their laws. Uh, I know like here in USA, there are uh, states where uh, they are uh, taking out people out of jail who were arrested because of cannabis. Uh, on that cannabis itself, uh, in Malawi, uh, there was a case, I think, a uh, few months ago, where I think it was a minor who was caught with cannabis. Uh, he was charged, I think, eight years in jail. But if with a follow up, we see that there were some truckers who had also a big quantity of cannabis, but they were just uh, given fine. So what is your de uh, department doing on cannabis laws uh, going forward? Thank you very much. Okay, uh, let, let, let me start with uh, Robert Chasowa's case. Um, the, oh, maybe I think I'll start with the latest update on such a case. Um, I think the latest that I got is that uh, you might have heard some people were being were arrested and that the cases are in court. And these are the things that will be um, handled by the Financial Crimes Court, a division of the High Court. Um, I think there have been about nine or 10 arrests so far on that one. So, um, yeah, so I think that is going to be the latest update. So perhaps just a matter of getting dates uh, of hearing for these uh, cases, if they are tried already. Um, SCB is prosecuting those cases. So on the Robert Chasowa case, um, I, I think I should be honest that the last time that uh, I discussed with the director of public presentation on this was the, uh, some six, seven months ago. So I need also to check. I think once we get back to a meeting like this one, I should be able to provide an update. I don't want to give you a wrong update that uh, this is what is going to happen. So I need to also go back and check with, on the update. Um, I think there was a problem of locating certain witnesses. Uh, Robert just saw as a, indeed a very sad case, uh, so to speak. Uh, it, it's same thing with the, uh, this uh, former SCB officer, employee, um, the Daunju. Um, but yes, Daunju. So I think that one, I think the latest subject that I got was this some five to months ago. And somehow um, one of the key investigators um, passed away, or true passed away. Um, I think there was a uh, Tekama who passed away. There's the, another guy uh, who also passed away. So this kind of slowed down um, the investigation um, of, of Jojo's case. Um, illegal selling of fuel, I don't know whether I got it right. Is it in this fuel crisis? But what I also know is that uh, the police are, uh, in fact, arresting those people that are uh, selling uh, fuel illegally. I should also be honest that I haven't been engaged on this to provide the opinion, but I've been in constant touch with the Marawi, uh, uh, Regret Marawi Energy Regulatory Authority, MIRA, uh, on how best actually to crack down on this. In fact, also on how best to crack down, even because these things were being done with the convenience of the filling stations, owners of the filling stations. So if punishment is to be given to the filling station owners, uh, therefore that uh, could also actually be a deterrent 
for even the employees and even the owners to supervise to prevent the illegal selling of fuel. The cannabis are right. Uh, US and other countries, Netherlands, now they freely trade in cannabis. We're lagging behind. We borrowed the laws from England. Um, I think with the Musa James, uh, a correction, Musa James was the sentence to eight years, his sentence was reduced to three years. And then he also worried, I think that was a question that I tackled earlier on, that there was there appeared to be some differential punishments. Others they went away fines by Musa James. Uh, was uh, given a custodial sentence. It's something that uh, uh, in the office of the director of public education, public relations, we discussed that in, even though that they, there are these guidelines to say certain quantities they will require uh, custodial sentences, but in situations where you have like cases, then we need to ensure that uh, those that uh, uh, deserve custodial sentences, they need these custodial sentences. So for those cases where um, uh, uh, non custodial sentences were given, the, uh, 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 the, 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 there'll be a review of, uh, of, of, of that. But uh, what you need also to bear in mind is that uh, if you have got a five gram of cannabis, you likely not go to prison. Uh, uh, one kg, but when you have got huge, huge quantities, maybe for commercial purposes, you are likely going to get under the existing laws a custodial sentence, and that custodial sentence will be wrong. So the larger the quantities, the longer the sentence that the court is likely going to impose. So there are guidelines that have been imposed uh, under the uh, under from the court judgments by the High Court. But then, of course, this is under the Dangerous Drugs Act, which is the required review something that will need to be initiated by relevant government departments before they come to my office. I hope I've answered, but I'll tackle this uh, area on. Somebody else asked ask a question on Musa, it's based on Musa. By the way, Musa was not a minor. I think he was not found to be a minor by the judgment. He was found to be a grown up person. Through you chair, just a quick one, I don't know. Hello, Chair. Please go ahead yeah. very, very yes. quickly. Very yes, quickly. very quickly. Uh, um, Bwana AG, housing, nyumba za housing. Yes. Politicians have been scrambling yes. nyumba za housing, kugula nyumba 3 million kuiria 47, kunyamba dwe. Is your department doing something to recover those houses? Mena housing, ana gula kungu gawa na ngadima suite. Please. Uh, uh, yes, this is part of our program on uh, recovery of assets, stolen assets. So it's not only Mala housing, corporation houses, but also lands. And uh, actually for all your own information, apart from that, with this project on recovery, they also have, we have houses, um, I was in court, there was a judgment as well, um, uh, where houses belonging to government were being occupied by, uh, Rwandese, Burundians, and like, but these were specifically constructed for the public servants. So uh, we, 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 we advised that the people should be evicted. They were evicted. They went to court and we fought. They lost the case. So part of the recovery of stolen assets includes this project, includes recovery of those houses that were dubiously uh, sold. Uh, in Blanta, not only in Blanta, but also in Lirong. Thank you. But by the way, I think unrelated to that, do you know that most of the buildings that government is renting used to belong to MDC? They are now in Pico. It's sad, really sad. Yeah. Too sad. Mm. Okay, thank you very much. As as you can see, AJ, we have so many questions to ask you, and it would really be great if we could have you a few times a year, actually. Again, yes. I'll yes. be very glad to have you again, I think, in the future. Even in with some of future. your colleagues, the people that you work with, to clarify several yes, things yes. for us. Um, at this yeah. point, I'd like to invite um, the Secretary of MCPDN, um, Pat Omainala. He has a few words. Thank you. 
Uh, first, uh, allow me to take this moment, opportunity to thank uh, Honorable Tabo Chakakanyilenda Tonijen for the Republic of Malawi for such a display of patriotism in the course of discharging your duties, sir. Thank you. Wherever we are thank around you. the globe, uh, you can all agree with me that Honorable Tabo Chakakanyilenda has shown love and respect to the Malawi nation in the way he is or and has executed his duties. He has led by example and indeed displayed the true meaning of patriotism by his actions. Today, sir, we have been privileged as we had the opportunity to address matters directed to you, sir, but also been able to hear from the horse's mouth about your office and other matters of national interest. All that's raised in the best interest of our nation to see a better Malawi than yesterday. This desire comes from all who truly love our country, both in diaspora and as you may have noticed, some joined from Malawi, mainly by those who are patriotic, just like you, sir. Patriotism that is displayed in actions. Indeed, sir, you have availed yourself by responding to our call to engage with us all. It cannot go without mentioning you have done this despite your busy schedules. We thank you for this. We also acknowledge that it is under the leadership of His Excellency, Dr. Lazarus Chakwera, President of the Republic of Malawi, that you are able to engage with us in diaspora in this manner. We thank His Excellency for his, this opportunity for us to engage with those who are at the heart of government. In the same spirit, it can only be reasonable to say all of us who have, be, who have taken time to be here on this forum in diaspora and in Malawi, it has been, it has been for the love of Malawi, bring, being patriotic to the nation we all love and respect. And thank you all for joining today. Coming back to patriotism once again, it is encouraging to note that many of us, just like in developed countries, the birthplace of democratic society values, we all have, have been able to rise above political differences and display patriotism to the nation we love and respect. In that regard, we at MCPDN, we believe we have a national duty to take part in the development of our nation more than ever before. We are here to serve the communities in ways that we can possibly do. It is in that same spirit, we spread the word of this kind of engagement to all Malawians, not just affiliates in our party. That is beyond and in the best interest to save our nations as one people. We only have one country, we have to work together and make it a better place. Being patriotic to the nation passed beyond any political affiliations, being patriotic in action. On these national duties, you are all welcome to join us in these engagements and also to bring in suggestions of any person you would like us to bring and we'll do our very best to uh, reach them. You can find us at mcpdnetwork at gmail.com. Our team will be ready to engage with you. Also, let me take this opportunity and invite those who may be interested to join our network. You can reach us at the same address, mcpdnetwork at gmail.com. You will be directed to the right people in your region. Our network is global. Wherever you are, we are ready to work with you. Today, also noted on this forum, our director, your Excellency, Dr. Thomas Bisika, and other High Commissioners and Ambassadors, thank you all for being with us today. You, your presence means a lot. In closing, I would like to close with this phrase quoted from former US President Theodore Roosevelt, and he said, the man who really counts in the world is the doer, not the merry critic, the man who actually does the work, even if laughly or imperfectly, not the man who only talks or writes about how it has to be done. Once again, thank you all and thank you, Honorable. Thank you. Thank you so much. 
Indeed, thank you very much. Um, before we close, I'd like to call upon Nick or Ospet to close with a word of prayer. And just to let you know that the recording of this session will be shared on the MCPDN Facebook page and on the MCPDN YouTube channel, if you would want to have a listen later. Um, thank you so much for being with us tonight. We'll take it for granted. And now let us pray. Um, Nick or Osbert. Let us pray. Father, we just want to thank you for the day today. I remember we, last year, it was that Mariah Carey yeah. Christmas song, come on. We want to thank you for the land, Malawi, our country, land of peace. And as we reckon in our national anthem that you've given us resources and you've given us uh, above all human resource and human capital. And today it all highlights the fact that we have people that are leading us in several sectors in the government back home that are quite a high resource. And beside, oh Lord Father, that us who are out of the country, we still have a heart for that land of peace. And we are also a resource. And we want to thank you for the engagement that has happened today. It has been highlighting, it has been engaging, and we have learned lots of things. We want to thank you that it has given us a different perspective on issues relating to development socially and economically. And we want to thank you that we have had a clear and an outright um, uh, clarity on the things that we have been burning in our hearts for everyone has a heart for the country, the good land of peace. We want to thank you for the honorable uh, 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 attorney general that had availed himself to be with us and also willing to be with us in further engagement and for everyone that was with us. And that the things that we have alluded to, the things that we have asked, the things that we have contributed there all for the betterment of our country. We pray that you disperse us in your love and that we can be that human capital, that we can be that human resource that can look back to our country and develop it further and make it better. Disperse us in your love. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. 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 Thank you very Amen. much. Amen. Amen. Um, Amen. Thank you. Good night. Good night. Bye. Thank you. Good night. Good night, everyone. Give it to go to Steve Perry. Bye, Amen. Thank you all. Great. Should we stop it?